and welcome to discussion about institutional review boards. This PowerPoint was assembled by Dr. Glenda Kaminsky, uh, one of the clinical nurse specialists at Lakeland Regional Medical Center. She's also the nursing representative to LRMC's IRB and um, was kind enough to share this PowerPoint with Polk State College. So let's talk about the history, ethical foundations, and researcher responsibilities. We're going to be talking about the historical context that led to the uh, requirements of IRBs, the ethical guidelines that established the basis for research compliance, and conclude with some of the key issues that researchers um, need to consider when submitting a study to an IRB. Now, you may never go through this step of going before an IRB with a research study, but it will make you more appreciative of what um, some researcher had to go through to get their study um, submitted to an IRB board when you read someone else's uh, research in the literature. So this is part of the whole research process and it's important for you to understand and appreciate all the steps that a researcher goes through when we utilize evidence from that uh, research in our clinical practice. So what exactly is an IRB? Quite literally, it means Institutional Review Board. The title comes directly from federal regulations. Some places have different names for their IRB, like Ethics Review Board, but it's basically the same thing. And the purpose is to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects and or participants. Now we've been talking about research all semester and whether it's qualitative or quantitative, research is a systematic investigation which includes research development, testing, and evaluation and it's designed to develop or contribute to generalized knowledge. Now how did IRBs get started? Well this is quote, sort of a comical um, look at a very serious topic. Here on the far left the researcher is lowering some mass to the subject below and someone's observing says, oh, we may need to do something to protect research subject. Oh, maybe you're right, as the poor subject is creamed by this falling ball. And then the last frame you see the little umbrella of protection over the subject. So that's essentially what an IRB is, is an umbrella of protection over uh, research subjects. Unfortunately, there have been some horrid historical examples um, for people harmed by research. And we're going to be talking about two of them today, the Nazi experimentation and the Tuskegee syphilis study. We all know about Nazi Germany and its legacy. The Nuremberg trials uh, related or put on trial scientists who were convicted um, for harming thousands of people in 12 different studies. Um, these studies were described in the trial indictment and all of these studies were absolutely horrific. Um, in one study, subjects had wounds deliberately inflicted upon them and then infected with bacteria such as strep, gangrene, or tetanus. 
con circulation to the wound was then restricted to simulate battle-like uh, conditions. The infection was aggravated by forcing wood shavings or ground glass into it. Subsequently, the infection was treated with sulfa or other types of drugs to study their effectiveness. Needless to say, the subjects suffered intensely and frequently died or experienced lifelong disabilities. Some important points to consider participation in these research trials were not voluntary. The subjects did not reasonably decide to participate, nor were they allowed to discontinue. There was absolutely no possible benefit to the subjects. They were definitely harmed as a result of the research. One group of people bore the burden of that research. Death was an accepted outcome. The government supported and sanctioned uh, this research. Science came before the subject's rights or welfare. It was this horrid chapter in the world's history. Equally horrid, uh, in a different way, was the Tuskegee syphilis study conducted in 1932 to 1972 when the government shut it down. This was slightly different uh, in its um, harm to subjects. The syphilis was not inflicted like um, infection was inflicted um, with the Nazi Germany subjects, but nonetheless it was uh, unethical in its own way. This study was conducted in a rural area in, in Alabama involving low-income African-American males. The year was uh, between 1932 and 1972. The subjects were told that they would receive free medical exams, meals, and burial insurance in exchange for participating in a study about quote-unquote bad blood, a local term used to describe several ailments. The study involved 600 black males. 399 of them had syphilis prior to joining the study. The purpose of this study was to examine the course of the disease if left untreated, potentially even to death. The problem came when penicillin was recognized for its curative effects on syphilis. This occurred a decade after the study started, but the penicillin was not provided to the participants. The, the researchers continued the study as if there was no medical knowledge of um, penicillin at all. And the researchers actively thwarted treatment for men who were drafted into the study after 1940 when they knew that penicillin was effective and available. So again, uh, the research wasn't totally voluntary. They didn't reasonably decide that they couldn't get the penicillin, cillin, and um, nor were they allowed to really discontinue the, in the study. There was no possible benefit to the subjects after it became known that penicillin was a um, viable treatment. Subjects definitely uh, were harmed. One group bore the burden. Death was an acceptable outcome. And science came before the subject's rights or welfare. Uh, the country was pretty outraged by uh, this type of, of uh, research. And like I said, the 
Tuskegee study was shut down in 1972, and out of that came the Belmont Report. This is the cornerstone statement of ethical principles upon which federal regulations for the protection of human participants involved in research are based. In 1974, the National Research Act was passed. This created a National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects in Biomedical <coughs> excuse me, and Behavioral Research. In 1979, this commission wrote the Belmont Report, which is on your PAL page under Week 7. These are the basics of this report. Respect for persons. Informed consent process must be included as part of the research process. And it must account for privacy and confidentiality. Beneficence. There is a risk to every research, but it has to be balanced by a greater benefit and the study has to have some scientific merit. And there has to be justice, especially with the review of subject selection. In terms of respects, respect for persons, every individual is considered to be autonomous and able to make informed health care decisions and those with diminished autonomy require some degree of protection like the mentally challenged or the elderly. Someone couldn't come in and just conduct research on this vulnerable population without um, due protection. There has to be a, a general theme of doing no harm and the benefits must be maximized while minimizing the harm. And the harm isn't just physical, it's considered to be psychological and financial as well. There must be fairness in distribution and this principle is applied in the consent process. So let's talk about informed consent. There must be a clear indication that this is research, that not everything is known and there is some element of unknown. There must be a clear description of what will be done and what risk there is to the subject as well as benef potential benefit to the subject. There must be an indication that the participation is voluntary and there must be alternatives to participation like I can decline and what are these alternatives. A statement about compensation for potential injury is needed and usually there's a statement that says there's no compensation but that needs to be clearly disclosed. The trouble with informed consents is often the reading level is too high and the language legalistic and it's very difficult to understand. Um, oftentimes they need extensive revision. So if you put yourself in the subject's shoes trying to understand what the heck a researcher is explaining, you can see that sometimes there needs to be revision to an informed consent. It must explain all the procedures and all the risks. And it must explain implications rather than simply stating a risk. And that implication usually has to do with f harm uh, to the subject. And sometimes a flowchart is considered an addendum that flows out the timeline of the study. So let's talk about what's considered a human subject. It is a living individual. So cadaver research is not considered human subject um, research because the individual is deceased 
and when someone donates their body to science it is assumed that that research and and um, teaching are, are going to occur so a living individual about whom an investigator conducts research and that research can be obtained through data on through an intervention or an interaction with the individual or with identifiable private health care information and it doesn't matter going back whether the investigator is a professional researcher or a student it's the same process the subject must still be protected so here are studies that require IRB approval clinical trials you see a lot of clinical trials occurring with cancer research survey observational or educational research must have IRB approval the review of someone's medical records or healthcare database must have IRB approval again this is protecting someone's private health care information someone's tissue or data um, must have IRB approval if there is um, research say you have an operation and a tissue part of your body is taken away your tissue human tissue um, someone can't do research on that without your knowledge information or knowledge and consent so it doesn't matter whether the tissue or data is identifiable or coded or anonymous um, it still needs IRB approval so this is a key point that all research must be approved before being conducted you can't start your research and then oh by the way rubber stamp this the the purpose is this is that before someone collects the first piece of data that um, IRB approval is granted so some a researcher goes to the IRB with a very clear research problem and question and hypothesis and research design and methodology and the whole nine yards but not uh, one piece of data is collected before IRB approval as uh, you would expect the um, the more involvement or risk to the human subject the more uh, involved the IRB becomes in terms of protection uh, federal requirements and associated uh, documentation and paperwork so down at the bottom number one is non-human research the next level is exempt the next level is expediated and the next the final level requiring the most protection the most requirements and the most paperwork because it involves the most amount of risk is a full board uh, approval so non-human research <clears throat> involves a uh, human tissue data etc but there's no interaction and no intervention with a living person and there's no exposure or collection of privately identified viable data exempt uh, research has to do with interaction or intervention with a living individual or their identifiable data but the research methodology has to do with more surveys observation or educational research there's no intervention involved there's no risk to the subject or there's potentially um, no risk to uh, having the data recorded anonymously so the survey does not collect identifiers 
so the survey itself doesn't have a name or a birthday or a clinic number or anything like that associated with it. So the the uh, descriptive statistics that would go along with this kind of research are really difficult to um, identify because the data isn't linked to a particular person. Exempt data could also be a review of existing uh, data, documents, and records that's recorded anonymously. Now the researcher sees the identifier, but all the data exists before IRB submission and the data are collected in such a way that it can't be linked back to the subject. So essentially these are like retrospective chart reviews, that type of thing, and the data is collected uh, in such a way that it can't be linked back. Expediated uh, research involves interaction or intervention with a living individual or their identifiable data, but there's minimal risk involved with the prospective collection of data. So it could be um, data collected on, on group characteristics or behaviors such as perception, cognition, motivation, identity, language, communication, cultural beliefs, practices, and social behavior, or research employing survey, interview, oral history, group evaluation, program evaluation, uh, or quality assurance methodologies. So this is um, this type of research puts a minimal risk on the subject. This type of research is approved for one year and the researcher must obtain approval for continued review and must also notify the IRB if there is an adverse event. And this, the, the researcher does more, so more protection is needed. For full board uh, approval, this is required when the research has greater than minimal risk, uses a vulnerable population, or the data are collected in such a way that um, can put someone at harm and also if the research involves some type of therapeutic research, any kind of radiation, x-ray, or genetics. Again, this is approved for one year. Must obtain reapproval for continuing review. Must notify for any adverse events. This tells a little bit about the difference between full board and expediated uh, board and, and the, the advanced notice required to the IRB. So if you have a very complicated research design that potentially puts your subjects at risk, the, um, the researcher has to submit to the IRB ahead of time their, their design so that the board can research it and digest it and look at it and make a, a um, informed decision. Typically the IRB decisions are um, one of four, either approval without any changes, great you did a good job, go. Approval with minor changes, this is the most common um, little tweaks in the research design. It's ta it could be tabled. Major questions have been raised about the study design, but still the IRB feels that the study might be worthwhile and, and let's discuss it some more before we recommend uh, certain things. 
and then rarely, but it does happen that the IRB uh, does not approve a research design. Any changes, no matter how minor, must be approved before the implementation. And any unanticipated problems uh, must be brought back before the IRB. And that includes adverse events, loss of data, or breach of confidentiality. Again, just to distinguish between privacy and confidentiality. Privacy refers to the subject's ability to control how other people see, touch, or obtain information about the subject. Confidentiality has to do with the way that identifiable information will be stored and shared. So the way it's stored and shared in, implies who's going to have access to that information. Is it going to be uh, left open where the cleaning people can, can come in and see that information or is it going to be locked under a variety of passwords and and definitely protected so that only the, the people who need to know that information have access to it. Um, these are some no-nos and Dr. Kaminsky included this rather sheepish looking puppy uh, in her picture or her slideshow here. Uh, conducting research prior to initial approval is definitely uh, not uh, being compliant with uh, federal research uh, protection laws. Conducting research after the approval expires is definitely um, an, another no-no. Uh, implementing revisions without prior IRB approval, over-enrolling, and enrolling subjects that are not approved by the IRB, such as vulnerable populations, are definitely more examples of non-compliance. Regulatory noncompliance is reported to the institution by the institution to the appropriate federal agency. So it is the institution's responsibility to protect uh, its, its subjects. And so if a researcher steps out of line, then that is reported to the federal, uh, federal governmental agencies. So in summary, IRB uh, institutional review boards protects the rights and welfare of subjects. Research approval is is uh, required before starting any kind of research. Ongoing approval is also required. There is a whole host of requirements, but the IRB is is available to help researchers. The ends do not justify the means. That's something that definitely was learned in a very tragic way through uh, harmful research such as uh, the Nazi uh, regime's research and Tuskegee uh, trials. And research is considered a privilege. The IRB protects the rights and welfare of its subjects. And here are Dr. Kaminsky's references. And I hope you have enjoyed this presentation by Dr. Glenda Kaminsky from Lakeland Regional Medical Center. Good day.